All right, I want to call attention to a couple of things. Um, started posting lectures and screencasts, so if you go on the Moodle page at the very top, you will find a link to lectures and screencasts. If you, um, if you click on that link, it'll just take you directly to the playlist for this course, this iteration. If you search for me, on YouTube, you will probably find iterations of past semesters where I've recorded lectures as well. Um, so I'll be updating those generally just to keep space on my iPad. I try and get them downloaded off my iPad and uploaded to YouTube um, every day that we have class. So that is there. I want to call your attention to other things. Um, Everybody seems to be frightened by exams for whatever reason. Uh, so what I've done is I've posted an old exam. It's from a couple of years ago, but um, it's an exam that covers the kind of material that we generally cover on first exam material. Uh, so you can um, kind of see what my style of writing an exam is. One of the keys to doing well on an exam is kind of getting inside of the head of your professor. And the best way to get inside the head of your professor where exams are concerned is to see old copies of exams, if they're available. Um, I know that fraternities and sororities and things like this keep exam files. At least they did when I was a student. Um, but I don't have any problem you seeing old exams. I write new exams every semester anyway. Things that are on the old exam will not be phrased exactly the same way and things like that. But the coverage should be the same. And there are only so many ways, there are only a limited number of ways that you can ask questions about certain topics. And so uh, hopefully um, those will, will be useful to you. Um, we're a little behind, so I have schedule on my mind a little bit, but we're just going to keep pressing on and if we end up being behind, the way I usually do exams is once I set an exam date in the syllabus, that's the exam date. If we don't cover all the material that's kind of on the schedule up to that point, I test you over the material that we've covered up to that point, and then we pick up where we left off after the exam is over. By not changing exam dates, it allows you to plan your life, and uh, it also keeps things spaced out kind of evenly throughout the semester. So. That is that. Any questions? All right, it's good to see a, a full complement of people here. Um, the material, as I mentioned last week, is uh, from the Plants and Society book on photosynthesis. You could basically get this information from, from any textbook, any plant-based sort of textbook. Um, Once again, I want you to be focused on aspects of photosynthesis that are important from the standpoint of agriculture. So we're going to be talking about two different photosynthetic pathways over the next couple of, couple of periods. The C3 pathway, which I've already mentioned, is done by wheat, soybeans, etc. And the C4 pathway that is done by things like corn and um, sugar cane and other things as well. But these are two big agricultural crops. So before we can kind of understand how those two pathways differ, we need to get a little bit of the basics of photosynthesis down. So the ways in which C3 and C4 photosynthesis differ from one another at the beginning are, are basically just how the plant goes about capturing carbon. So carbon dioxide is floating around in the air, and the first thing that the plant has to do is that it has to grab onto that carbon dioxide. Ultimately, it's going to take the carbon molecules in that carbon dioxide, and it's going to ultimately convert them into glucose, which has six carbon molecules in it. And it's this carbon capture portion of photosynthesis that is really how C3 and C4 plants uh, differ from one another. 
So be able to talk about that in terms of C3 and C4 plants is something that you should be able to do by the time we're done with this. Um, relate those two pathways to photosynthetic efficiency under different conditions. Remember that C3 plants do best under what types of conditions? From last week, yeah. C3? Moist, cool. And C4 does best under? Yep, dry, hot environments. And this has, once again, everything to do with the way the plants go about capturing carbon. And then, ultimately, we want to be able to, to relate these things to agriculture, agricultural processes and patterns. And so we'll look at some geographic distributions of agriculture in the United States at the end that will basically show you um, that these things are true for agricultural crops just as they are for any other crop or any other plant, C3, C4 plant. So brief review. I showed you this figure last week. Uh, this is a cross section through a leaf. I've removed all the labels, so let's have a little quiz. See if you remember any of this. What are the layers of cells at the top and the bottom of the leaf? This is the top of the leaf. This is the bottom of the leaf. Single layer of cells kind of form an envelope that the rest of the leaf is sandwiched between. Not the cell wall, that's actually a part of the cells. The cellulose layer that goes around the cells that make them kind of semi-rigid. So each of these cells, this cell here would be surrounded by a cell wall, this cell here would be surrounded by a cell wall, et cetera, et cetera. As will all of these be surrounded by cell walls. It's a general feature of all plant cells. I'm looking for the overall layer. Nope, xylem and phloem are what? So the xylem and phloem are involved in fluid transport, and so fluid transport is found in the vein that is right here. Xylem on top, phloem on the bottom. It's the epidermis. We have an upper epidermis on the upper side of the leaf, and we have the lower epidermis. The purpose of that epidermis is to do what? Yeah, basically seals up the insides. It's this kind of impervious layer um, of cells that basically sandwiches in everything in between. They also excrete this waxy coating on the surface of the leaf called the cuticle. And all of that is actually designed to avoid water loss. So the upper epidermis and the lower epidermis and the cuticle are designed to prevent water loss. And those layers of the leaf are pretty effective at that. But in the process of preventing water loss, it also prevents the movement of air into and out of the leaf. And the leaf has all these air spaces interspersed among these cells. What are these cell types called in the middle of the leaf? Yep, it does. Mesophyll. Easy way to remember this is this root meso essentially means middle. And so the mesophyll cells are actually where photosynthesis occurs, especially where carbon, initial carbon capture occurs. And they need access to carbon dioxide. So how do plants go about getting access to carbon dioxide? What's a modification in this case on the lower epidermis that allows air to get from outside the leaf to inside the leaf? It's these openings right here and right here. Yeah. Stoma, yep, stomata. Stoma is, is one. Stomata is plural. These are these openings in the leaf epidermis. And they are guarded on both sides by little donut-shaped 
little cells that, that form a donut shape, uh, these cells are called guard cells. And I don't think I gave you that term last week. And these guard cells either swell up or shrink down. When they're swollen up, it closes the stoma. And when they shrink down, it opens up the stoma. And this is how gases get from outside the leaf to inside the leaf. But the problem with opening those, these stomata to allow air to come into the leaf is that water vapor tends to evaporate and leave the leaf whenever those things are open. So one of the things that a leaf would want, want to do if a leaf, if a leaf could have desires is it wants to keep those stomata closed as much as possible to avoid losing water. So leaf structure, crucially important to understanding differences between C3 and C4 photosynthesis. What are the names of the cells that go around the xylem and phloem? Remember, this is called the vascular bundle. What are those cells around that called? Yeah, the bundle sheath cells, yep. And those are very important because those are important for photosynthesis in C4 plants. So, good. Um, photosynthesis, is, photosynthesis is basically the conversion of light energy to chemical energy, and it's done by plants for the most part. Um, it takes carbon dioxide and water and turns it into glucose, and it uses energy from the sun or your grow lights in your basement or whatever. It occurs in two phases. There's the light dependent reactions, reactions that require the presence of light. And then there are these light independent reactions. They used to be called the dark reactions, but they occur in both light and dark. So we refer to them as just reactions that are independent of light because they can proceed in the absence of light. When you think about light, the electromagnetic spectrum includes everything from infrared rays to, to x-rays, but it's just this narrow band of visible light that leaves are able to use. And um, when we look at the response of different types of pigments in a leaf, they also only use certain wavelengths of light. And so, for example, if you want to set up, um, like I do, in the winter, I will usually start some plants in my basement getting ready for planting in the spring, start my tomatoes early and things like that so that I don't have to wait until August or September to get tomatoes. I can get tomatoes back in, in June and July. Well, when you buy lights to start your plants in a basement, you need to pay attention to the, the temperature of the light, the different wavelengths of light that, that, that those lights are putting out because the photosynthetic pigments, pigments, chlorophyll A and B, respond to different wavelengths of light differently. And so we tend to see that chlorophyll responds to violet and blue light pretty well and to red and orange light, does not respond to green and yellow light. When you look at a leaf, it's green. The reason that the leaf is green is because it's absorbing all of the other wavelengths of light except green. Green is the wavelength of light that it doesn't absorb and that is reflected back at you. So I'm wearing a black t-shirt today. I wore a black t-shirt specifically for this reason. Black is absorbing all of the wavelengths of light. Which is why if you have black upholstery in your car, it looks nice and everything else. It cleans up well, but it gets really hot in the summertime because it's absorbing all the wavelengths of light. So my shirt is absorbing all the wavelengths of light. Therefore, it's reflecting no wavelengths of light back at you. If you're wearing a red William Jewell College shirt, which some of you are wearing, it's absorbing all of these other wavelengths of light, except for wavelengths in the red zone, which it is not absorbing, which is why that red light is reflected back. So green is reflected back, and leaves are green, not because they're absorbing green light, because they're reflecting green light back. So these are the wavelengths that, that plants are capable of using. And in the leaf, there are these little structures that we talked about before called chloroplasts. And this is where these light-dependent reactions occur. And in the light-dependent reactions, what happens, I should have put this in a slightly different order, I think.
Yeah, let's do it this way. In the light-dependent reaction, so I've, I've skipped forward four or five slides relative to where we were before. This happens in the chloroplast on the membrane of the chloroplast. This is where the chlorophyll is actually located. And what a pigment is, in, in the strictest of scientific terms, a pigment is just any compound that is capable of absorbing light. So there are pigments in your shirt, and those pigments absorb certain wavelengths of light and don't absorb other wavelengths of light. Chlorophyll is the same way. The difference about chlorophyll is that those pigments are linked to energy capture mechanisms. So um, when you have, well, you're, you're too, too young for this. You guys ever play around with black lights? Back in the 1970s when I grew up, they had these cool posters. They were made out of velvet, but then they had places where it was painted, and it was painted in fluorescent inks, uh, fluorescent paints, and you could turn on the black light in your room, and, and it would change the colors of these things because the pigments in those paints absorbed ultraviolet light, and rather than storing that ultraviolet light, the energy from that ultraviolet light, it radiated that ultraviolet light back to you in visible light. And this is what happens when you have fluorescent, this is what fluorescent pigments are about. It absorbs ultraviolet light and then radiates that energy back to you in the form of visible light. You can't see ultraviolet, but you can see visible light. Well, what, what is basically happening is when those pigments absorb that ultraviolet light, the atoms in those pigments have electrons floating around. So if you pay attention to chemistry at all, if you had chemistry in high school, did it, how many of you had chemistry in high school? Well, practically everybody, not quite everybody. If you, were, if you were taught the structure of an atom in high school, you would be taught that uh, atoms are made up of a nucleus, which is where the neutrons and the protons live, this is a carbon atom because it has six protons and six neutrons. And you also would have known that these protons are positively charged. And so you have electrons that exist in these, these rings, these shells around the, the nucleus. The first shell is capable of holding two electrons. The next shell can hold eight electrons. And in theory, these things occur in pairs. And so each orbital, essentially, is paired. It can hold two electrons. In the case of carbon, because there are two electrons in this first shell, there's only four electrons in the second shell, which means that carbon can form four bonds with other things because it has four orbitals that are only half full. So it needs another electron to fill those things up. When it fills those things up, it's stable. It can't bond with anything else because all of its orbitals are full. Well, when light comes in and strikes an atom in a fluorescent pigment, in, in any pigment for that matter, one of the things that can happen is that this electron can absorb that light and it gains energy and it hops up into another energy state. It basically is, is driven kind of further away from the nucleus than it was before. And this is, a, this is a very inaccurate way of thinking of atoms. You should more think of atoms as a nucleus where the proton and neutron lives, and then all these electrons are zipping around in space in a cloud, and they're just zooming around randomly such that you have this three-dimensional sphere of electrons that are just moving freely around the, around the, the nucleus. And when this electron absorbs energy, basically moves further out, and when it moves further out, it can be picked up by an electron acceptor. 
And so essentially that atom loses that electron. Now it has one fewer electrons than it had before. In a fluorescent dye, like you would have on a groovy t-shirt or on a groovy poster in your room in the 1970s, this electron buffs out to this higher energy state, but then it immediately falls back. And when it falls back, it gives off visible light where it has absorbed ultraviolet light. So it's stored by ultraviolet light, it gets energized, there's nothing to capture that extra energy, so it falls back to its native state, and when it does, it releases that energy, and it releases it in the form of, of light energy. But in the chloroplast of plant cells, when that electron gets energized, it gets captured by another compound. And then, rather than releasing that energy in a wasteful sort of way, it gets transferred from one compound to another compound to another compound in a set of chain, chain of compounds. And that energy is slowly released over this, these multiple transitions, moving the electron from one compound to another compound to another compound to another compound. And as that energy is bled off of that electron, that energy is used to create ATP. ATP is short for adenosine triphosphate. That's not nearly as important as this is one of the ways in which organisms store and transport energy. You basically take a molecule that has two phosphates attached to it, you attach another phosphate to it, and the energy in that bond is how energy is stored. So I do endurance cycling. I go on long bicycle rides. When you get to about 80 miles into a 100-mile ride, for me, it usually occurs between 70 and 80 miles. I sometimes bonk. You guys know what it is to bonk? Those of you who are athletes? Oh, okay. Well, if you're an endurance athlete, there, there comes this point where if you haven't fueled yourself adequately, you just get to this point where you kind of your body loses energy because you've been burning up energy for the last 80 miles. It occurs with people in marathons at about mile 20 to 22. It occurs in cyclists, in 100-mile events. For me, once again, it occurs. If it's going to occur, it occurs about 70 to 75 miles in. If I can get past 75 or 78 miles, I'm good for the rest of the ride. But I have had so many struggles in that little window uh, over the years. And what's happened is your body stores ATP, and then you use that up. And if you're not giving your body back energy to restore that ATP, add those phosphates back to, to adenosine diphosphate, uh, you basically kind of run out of ATP. Uh, the ATP that is available to do to do work, and so I've gotten better over the years about fueling. I haven't I haven't bonked at 75 miles in in quite some time, um, but there's that risk, and it's because all of this stored energy that is formed by adding this phosphorus molecule to to this compound. You, you basically use that up. And so ATP is one of the ways in which you store energy. The other way in which you store energy is in a compound called NADPH. And this is stored energy mainly in the form of hydrogen ions. It doesn't matter really, all of that. The thing that you need to remember is that light provides energy to pigments. Those pigments energize electrons, and that's how the plant captures energy. And the plant is going to take that captured energy in the form of an electron, and it's going to use it to add a phosphorus to ADP to create this stored chemical form of energy called ATP. Yeah? I can. What you need to know is that light... You're going to run back the video and say, he said the exact same thing in exactly the same way. Take light energy captured by the pigments in the plant cell, in the, in the chloroplast of the plant cell, to basically energize this electron 
the energy that that electron captures is then stored in the form of ATP. So in order to convert carbon dioxide into glucose, you have to get energy from somewhere. And you get it from the sun, but it doesn't work with sunlight directly. You use sunlight to form chemical energy in the form of ATP. Then that chemical energy in the form of ATP is going to be used to actually capture carbon. So this first stage is the light independent reactions, which is where you get the energy for photosynthesis. But the part that we're mainly concerned about is the carbon capture part, getting carbon into the plant cell and incorporating it into carbon dioxide. So let's go back. to here. So this is the equation for photosynthesis. You take carbon dioxide and water. You use chlorophyll, which is a pigment. It's the pigment that is involved in this initial capture of light energy. And you, you use an enzyme called Rubisco. you will see that I write Rubisco in a very peculiar way. I write it this way and I'll explain why I do that in a minute. So you take carbon dioxide and water and you use those raw materials to create glucose, which is kind of the goal of the plant, because that's the really long-term storage form of energy. Stable storage of energy is in glucose molecules. And then as a byproduct, it produces oxygen and then you have some water left over. Anytime you're going to be adding atoms and molecules together with one another, in organisms, we almost always do this with enzymes. So Rubisco is an enzyme. It is an enzyme, and what it does is it adds a carbon dioxide to this thing called RUB. P. You don't really need to know what RUBP is, except that it's a five carbon compound that is in the cell. It's in the chloroplast. So an enzyme basically just makes chemical reactions occur more easily with less energy. So this is a wooden door. This wooden door is filled with cellulose. It's the stuff that's in the plant cell wall. Somebody mentioned cell walls earlier today. Wood is just a bunch of cell walls that have dried out over time. There's a lot of energy in there because cellulose is just made up of a bunch of glucose molecules all bonded together with one another in a particular way. So it's just glucose. That door is just made of glucose in the form of cellulose. There's a lot of energy in this door. How can we release that energy? What's one way to release the energy in that door? Nope, that doesn't, all that energy is still in the door. All you're doing there is you're messing with the energy in the spring mechanism at the top. Heat it, Heat it up to the point that it, it bursts into flames. And then all the stored energy in that door bursts into flames, burns up, and leaves you with carbon dioxide and water. It releases carbon dioxide and it releases water. So it's basically taking this equation, taking glucose and oxygen, adding heat to it, to have this exothermic reaction that releases a lot of heat to produce carbon dioxide and water. So you can build glucose up and you can tear glucose down. Building it up requires the input of energy. Tearing it down results in the release of energy. You have glucose inside of you. Your body stores glucose that you get out of the food that you eat. 
And your metabolism, the thing that keeps you going through that mid-afternoon slump that you experience when you have a 1.30 or 2.30 class, that glucose, you're breaking down and it's releasing energy. Why do you not burst into flames? You're burning up glucose right now just sitting here being a mouth breather behind your mask. Why are you not bursting into flames? Because your body possesses what? That helps control that reaction that releases energy. What do you have working for you? What are we talking about that's on the board? Hmm? We don't have cellulose. Actually, we're incapable of processing cellulose, as it turns out. You need special enzymes to process cellulose, and we don't have those. Cows don't even have them, and they eat a lot of cellulose. They have a bacteria that has the right enzymes. Oh, well, what did I just say? Enzymes. We have enzymes that take glucose and break that glucose down in ways that require less energy to get that reaction started and also control the rate at which that reaction happens. To burn this door, what do we have to do? We have to hold a flame to that door for a while until there's enough energy for the reaction to then go and proceed on its own. We can't do that in our bodies. We would burst into flames ourselves. And so we have enzymes that reduce the amount of energy that is required for the reaction to go to completion and also con controls how that reaction proceeds so that we don't have an uncontrolled reaction, which is what a fire is. We have a bunch of controlled reactions in our bodies. So what enzymes do is enzymes control the rate of reaction and they control the rate of reaction by controlling the amount of energy that is required to get a reaction to function. And so Rubisco is just a type of enzyme, and it functions by reducing the amount of energy that is required to get carbon dioxide added to something. If you're interested in how exactly enzymes do that, Go take a biochemistry class. We're not going to get into it, but just know that that's how enzymes function. You have enzymes for all kinds of things in your body. More enzymes than I can even think about. They do all sorts of things, but the purpose of those things is to make chemical reactions proceed more orderly and easier than if those enzymes didn't exist. So Rubisco is a type of enzyme. This is one of the few really technical terms I'm going to ask you to learn. Rubisco stands for ribulose bisphosphate carboxylase oxygenase. Just suck it up and do it. That's all I can tell you. Because the name is important. Remember, I'm not going to tell you anything that's not important for understanding something. This is one of those things that is important. But more particularly... So the reason that I write Rubisco this way is that the RU stands for ribulose, the BIS stands for bisphosphate, the C stands for carboxylase, and the O stands for oxygenase. Anytime you see a chemical compound that ends in ASE, this is an enzyme. Scientists are not that smart, so we build conventions. So that anytime somebody says something that has an ASE at the end of it, we know that that's an enzyme. We may not know what that enzyme does. Amylase. Salivary amylase. What does salivary amylase do? Salivary amylase is secreted by your salivary glands and it breaks down starch. But you don't need to know that necessarily. But one of the things that you do know when I say the word amylase, because that ASE ending, you know that that's an enzyme. 
In this case, it happens to be an enzyme that breaks down starch. Carboxylase Carboxyl is also a CO2 that is not bonded to anything. So carboxylase is an enzyme that works on CO2. Oxygenase is an enzyme that works on oxygen. So this is an unusual enzyme and it has two enzymatic functions potentially. It can interact with carbon dioxide and it can interact with oxygen. What it does in both of these cases is it's going to add carbon dioxide to this compound RUBP, but it could just as easily add oxygen to that compound. Okay, so this is a, a, a more generalized functioning enzyme than a more specific enzyme would be that would perhaps only interact with carbon dioxide. This becomes important because in C3 photosynthesis, what happens is we bring in a molecule of carbon dioxide. We add that to RUBP, which once again is this five carbon compound. And when we do that, it creates a six carbon compound. And then this breaks down very quickly into two to three carbon compounds. And this is where C3 comes from because this first intermediate step has three carbons, C3. How many carbons do you need to make glucose? Well, you need six of them. And so you have to do this essentially six times to capture six molecules of carbon dioxide. But this beginning phase you take, a three, you take a single carbon atom, you add it to a five carbon atom that gets recycled in the cell to get this, this six carbon molecule that then breaks down to two, three carbon molecules. This occurs in the mesophyll cells. So this is occurring in all these mesophyll cells. It is not occurring in the vascular bundle, just in the mesophyll cells. And it occurs in plants like wheat. So once again, this is a, a C3 plant. C4 photosynthesis has the same chemical equation, but the path that you use to get there is a little more complicated. So in C4 photosynthesis, the first intermediate product has four carbons, not six carbons. And it uses a different enzyme. It uses something called PEP carboxylase. You know this is an enzyme Y. You have the ASC at the end. What does this enzyme operate on? What does it interact with? Carbon dioxide. Does it interact with oxygen? No, not at all. We would have called it an oxygenase then. So we know that PEP carboxylase only interacts with carbon dioxide because it's a carboxylase. It doesn't have an oxygenase function. So PEP carboxylase only interacts with carbon dioxide. This is a great advantage to a plant because the plant isn't trying to capture oxygen. It's trying to capture carbon dioxide. And so if you possess this enzyme, you now have a more specific enzyme that is specific to interacting with carbon dioxide. In this case, photosynthesis occurs in two different places within the leaf. Part of photosynthesis occurs out in the mesophyll cells and then part of it occurs in the bundle sheath cells. Once again, I told you about the bundle sheath cells and told you what their location was, but I only told you that because that becomes important because photosynthesis in C4 plants 
takes place in both places. Part of the process goes on in the mesophyll cells, then the products of that process get shifted, get transported to the bundle sheath cells for the rest of photosynthesis to take place. And this occurs in things like corn and sugarcane and it uses this enzyme called PEP carboxylase. So they differ in the enzymes that are involved. C4 plants still end up using Rubisco, but Rubisco in C4 plants is only found in the bundle sheath cells. It's not found out in the mesophyll cells. And I'll explain why in a minute. Any questions at this point? Okay. We've already talked about the light reactions. Review the structure of the leaf. We have the upper and lower epidermis. We have the mesophyll cells. We have the bundle sheath cells going around the vascular bundle. We have stomata that are guarded by guard cells that open and close the stomata. If you're taking notes right now, stop taking notes for a few minutes because I'm going to walk you through something and I want you to be paying attention to the walkthrough. After we're done walking through it, I'll come back and I'll go through it again. You can take notes on it. If you're downloading the PowerPoints, do not download them as a flat file. View them actually in PowerPoint because there's an animation. That I frequently use animations, but in this case, this animation is crucial to understanding what is going on in the plant leaf relative to the movement of, of products into and out of the leaf relative to, to photosynthesis. So view it in PowerPoint because if you just view it as a flat file, it'll look weird to you and it won't have the same, same process illustrated for you. So let me clean my board off. I have new stuff to write. So in this figure, we have the upper epidermis and the lower epidermis. This is a stomata. This is a stoma. We have these the air spaces in the leaf between the mesophyll cells. And I have uh, three compounds listed here. We have carbon dioxide, we have oxygen, and we have water. We have carbon dioxide, oxygen, and water. Water is in the form of water vapor, just moisture floating around in the air, humidity, if you want to think of it that way. And then we have Rubisco, and Rubisco is found in these mesophyll cells in a C3 plant. I've coded these compounds according to how abundant they are. When you're inside the leaf, there's a lot of water. When you're inside the leaf, there's a lot of carbon dioxide. When you're inside the leaf, there's a lot of oxygen. The chemical, com the chemical makeup of the atmosphere is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 0.03% carbon dioxide, actually. So carbon dioxide is not very abundant in the atmosphere. You hear people talk about global warming and things like that, and you think, oh, there's a lot of, of carbon dioxide floating in the, around in the atmosphere. Well, it's just that there's more carbon dioxide than there used to be. In general, though, carbon dioxide is relatively uncommon in the atmosphere. So is oxygen. When you breathe in and out, you're breathing in and out mainly nitrogen. Any of you ever go scuba diving? No. Yeah, you have. Do you go very deep for very long? No. What happens if you go diving for a long period of time? Stay down deep. What do you have to do when you come back up? Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, you have to decompress. And uh, a friend of mine is, is a deep sea diver. Um, she works in Hawaii and she goes down to, she dives so far down in the ocean, she dives down to where there's no light anymore. She studies corals. Uh, in this this mesophotic region of the water column where light, the last light is fading out. 
and she'll go down. She has a rebreather, which is an apparatus that recirculates your air because she'll go down for six or eight hours at a time on just a couple of tanks. And so she has this rebreather apparatus. And when she comes up, she has to spend a lot of time decompressing. So she comes up a little ways, hangs out there, comes up a little ways, hangs out there. And what is what she's doing is she is basically allowing her lungs time to get rid of all of the nitrogen gas that is built up in her bloodstream. If she doesn't, that nitrogen gas expands. It gives you bubbles in your blood, gives you the bends, and can potentially kill you. Uh, and that would be bad. She would not be able to study corals anymore. So you're breathing in a bunch of nitrogen, but you breathe it in, you breathe it out, it gets dissolved in your, in your bloodstream, but eventually it just diffuses out of your bloodstream. Oxygen, though, is relatively abundant. So if you have something like Rubisco that acts as a carbon a carboxylase interacting with carbon dioxide and acts as an oxygenase, which interacts with oxygen, there's a lot more oxygen in atmospheric air to interact with than there is carbon dioxide. That presents a problem for plants. So because these cells are exposed, and because the epidermis keeps fluids in to the plant, keeps them from dehydrating, the concentration of water vapor inside the plant is much higher than the concentration of water vapor outside the plant. So there's this, what we call a diffusion differential. Um, you guys probably were exposed to diffusion back in junior high or high school. If I opened up a, a bottle of perfume up here, it would diffuse through the room because there's energy in the room. The energy interacts with the surface of the perfume. It releases those molecules of perfume and they would slowly drift from an area of high concentration, the perfume bottle up here, to areas of low concentration at the back of the room until eventually you would be able to smell um, the perfume everywhere. You guys in the front would smell it first, then people in the middle would smell it, and then people in the back. And if you left the perfume out long enough, you would get to the point where all of the perfume would evaporate and all of the perfume molecules would be evenly distributed throughout the room. And at that point, there's now no net movement of perfume in the room. It's just every corner of the room smells like perfume. And hopefully it's good perfume rather than some stinky perfume. So diffusion involves the movement of molecules from areas of high concentration to areas of low concentration. So we have a plant. It has just opened its stomata, and now it's closed its stomata. So it has the same concentration of carbon dioxide inside and outside the leaf, has the same concentration of oxygen inside the, and outside the leaf. But as soon as these things close, the concentration of water starts going up because there's no movement of water, and water is evaporating out of these adjacent cells. Increasing the concentration of water in here while the concentration of water out here stays the same. So you're building up a concentration of water simply because you have those exposed cells in the leaf. Now, as the plant does photosynthesis, it's going to take carbon dioxide and convert it to glucose. So what happens to the concentration of carbon dioxide inside those air spaces in the leaf? As it converts carbon dioxide to glucose, what happens to the carbon dioxide that's in the leaf? It's being captured by Rubisco, incorporated into glucose. And what happens to this concentration? It goes down. It goes down and down and down and down until finally the leaf has captured all of the carbon dioxide that there is to capture in that leaf space, in the air in those leaf spaces. Once the levels of carbon dioxide go down to a point, what does Rubisco start doing? It interacts with carbon dioxide, but it also interacts with oxygen. Also interacts with oxygen. So when carbon dioxide levels drop, Rubisco shifts to grabbing onto oxygen and incorporating oxygen into the photosynthetic pathway, but that's not adding carbon, and you have to be adding carbon to get the formation of glucose. And so Rubisco is problematic because 
it needs a ready supply of carbon in order to avoid picking up oxygen. So what does it do? It needs more carbon dioxide, what can you do if you're a leaf, if you're a plant? Open your stomata. Open your stomata. What can now happen? What's the concentration of carbon dioxide inside the leaf? Really, really low. What's the concentration of carbon dioxide outside the leaf? Pretty low, but way higher than it is inside the leaf. So diffusion will allow carbon dioxide to enter the leaf and restore that supply of carbon dioxide. But while that stomata is open, while that stoma is open, what else is happening? Yep, carbon dioxide flows down a concentration gradient. Water also flows down a concentration gradient. So the whole time that you're bringing in carbon dioxide, you're losing water. This is one of the costs of doing photosynthesis is that it's costly in terms of water. Then the stomata close back up and then the plant can go back to doing photosynthesis and the photosynthesis that it does is efficient because there's a lot of carbon dioxide in the leaf now and it has plenty of carbon to latch on to. The reason C3 plants do well in cool, moist environments is that whenever they run out of carbon dioxide, they just open up their stomata. And because it's cool, they don't lose a lot of water to evaporation. And even if they did, it's moist so they can always reabsorb that water through the roots send it back up to the leaves and they're fine. They're not gonna wilt and die because they're water stressed. If you're a plant in a hot, dry environment though, every time you open up your stomata, you bring in carbon dioxide, but you lose water. You keep doing that a lot, you eventually lose so much water that you wilt and ultimately die. And so C4 plants have come up with a different way of dealing with carbon dioxide than C3 plants. All right, take notes. Did you guys follow all that? Fine, okay. At the beginning, the plant has just closed its stomata. It has equal concentrations of carbon dioxide, equal concentrations of oxygen, but there's a differential, there's a, a differential gradient in water, more water inside the leaf than outside the leaf. During photosynthesis, what does Rubisco do? It captures carbon to incorporate into glucose. And so we have this movement of carbon dioxide from the air spaces inside the leaf into the mesophyll cells. And as that occurs, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the leaf goes down until finally it gets low enough that Rubisco begins to interact with oxygen because there's less and less carbon dioxide to interact with. And Rubisco, because it's a carboxylase and an oxygenase, can interact with both of those. That's bad because oxygen is not what you want to be adding to RUBP, ribulose bisphosphate, because that doesn't lead to the formation of, of glucose in a very efficient way. And so the plant needs to restore the concentration of CO2. It does that by opening the stomata. When the stomata open, carbon dioxide can flow in down this concentration gradient, but there's also a concentration gradient for water. And so water flows out of the cell. And so when the plant needs carbon dioxide, it can get it, but one of the costs of getting that carbon dioxide is that it loses water. Simple C3 photosynthesis carbon capture. Once carbon capture occurs, you basically take carbon dioxide, you go through this thing called the, the Calvin cycle, and it makes glucose. And you don't need to know any of the details of that. Just know that, that it makes glucose once it has the carbon. In a C4 plant, though, 
A C4 plant living in a hot, dry environment has to reduce the amount of time that its stomata are open. So they've come up with this clever way through evolution over evolutionary time where they have partitioned carbon capture from glucose production. So glucose production is the Kelvin cycle here. And so what a C4 plant does is rather than relying on Rubisco to do initial carbon capture, it allows on, oh, it, it relies on PEP carboxylase. PEP carboxylase only interacts with carbon dioxide, does not interact with oxygen. So these are the mesophyll cells. These are the bundle sheath cells. What happens in a C4 plant is initial carbon fixation goes on in the mesophyll cells, but it involves PEP carboxylase, not Rubisco. So what happens is carbon dioxide gets latched onto by PEP carboxylase. So it's captured here in an oxygen-rich environment. But it's in an oxygen-rich environment, but there's an enzyme there that only interacts with carbon dioxide. So it picks up carbon dioxide from this oxygen-rich environment, then it transfers that carbon dioxide to the bundle she cell. The bundle she cell is where Rubisco lives. Rubisco doesn't live out in the mesophyll cells. And these bundle she cells have a layer of lignin around them. And this prevents the passage of many of the, the things that would pass through there. It, it thwarts the passage of water. It thwarts the passage of gases. And so you have these canals that we talked about when we were talking about uh, cell structure. These were these little tunnels that go between cells. There are little tunnels that go between the mesophyll cell and the bundle she cell that allows for the transport of materials from one cell to another. But it doesn't transport carbon dioxide in its raw form. It, convert, it carries carbon dioxide in the form of malic acid. So when we get CO2 interacting with PEP carboxylase, it produces malic acid. And that malic acid gets transported into the bundle she cell. All that malic acid is, is it's just a carrier for carbon dioxide. Once that's in there, an enzyme strips off the carbon dioxide and it adds it to Rubisco. Rubisco captures it at that point. And now you have Rubisco capturing carbon dioxide and then sending it to the Kelvin cycle to make glucose. But it's now being done in an oxygen-free environment inside the bundle she cell. So the Rubisco is protected from oxygen in the bundle she cell. And the cells that are exposed to an oxygen-rich environment, the mesophyll cells in a C4 plant, have enzymes that only interact with carbon dioxide and don't interact with oxygen. And they don't have Rubisco out in those cells. So Rubisco only occurs in these bundle sheet cells. And in this way, I should make it, I should make it a new, a new animation for this. I don't know why I don't. In this way, Rubisco is not out here. Rubisco is in here. PEP carboxylase is out here. PEP carboxylase only interacts with carbon dioxide doesn't interact with oxygen. So when PEP carboxylase is capturing carbon initially, it can deplete carbon dioxide all the way because as soon as it's all gone, PEP carboxylase does not interact with oxygen. So it can suck out all the carbon dioxide that there is before it opens its stomata. Because it depletes the carbon dioxide in the, in the leaf, that concentration gradient is really steep, so the rate of diffusion is really fast. So that when it opens its stomata, CO2 flows in really fast, 
Water flows out at the same rate, and so it can open its stomata and close them very quickly and restore that carbon dioxide balance very quickly because it's depleted all of the carbon dioxide in the leaf spaces. C3 plants don't do that. C3 plants open their stomata when there's still quite a lot of carbon dioxide inside the leaf spaces in the plant. They open them when it falls below a certain level. Whereas C4 plants can just keep them closed for longer periods of time, deplete that carbon dioxide before they open those stomata because the concentration gradient is greater, carbon dioxide flows in really quickly, which reduces the amount of time that they have to keep those stomata open. And as a result, they reduce water loss. Which is why C3 plants grow best in cool, moist environments, and C4 plants occur in hot, dry environments. Questions about all that? I will occasionally give you homework assignments that are intended to get you to learn. I don't ever, I'm never going to take them up. I'm never going to grade them. They're just things that I want you to do because it will help you learn. Um, one of the ways that I find productive and, and students have also found productive, whenever you're given two different things that, that you compare and contrast with one another, it's sometimes useful to make a table. So homework for tomorrow. Make a table for C3 plants and C4 plants and then whatever aspect of, of C3 and C4 plants are that, that, you could, that you could have. So one of the things you might say is, what are the reactants? The reactants are the things on the left-hand side of the equation. The products are the things on the right-hand side. Where does... carbon fixation occur? What enzyme involved in initial carbon fixation? Et cetera, et cetera. You can just think about, think about photosynthesis in terms of what are the important things about photosynthesis. Well, for, for both C3 and C4 plants, the reactants are both carbon dioxide and water. And the products are glucose and water and oxygen. And it's the same for C4 plants. But initial carbon fixation for both of these, they both occur in the mesophyll cells for both of these. And in this case, the enzyme that is involved in initial carbon fixation is Rubisco. And in this case, it's pepcarboxylase. Et cetera, et cetera. So, Make yourself a table that breaks things down. There are other aspects of photosynthesis other than those things that you might want to include in your table as well. Plus, I wrote it up there really quickly, and then I erased it really quickly, so hopefully you don't remember all of that. Do that as one way of kind of sorting this stuff out. Questions? All right, we still have a little bit to talk about in terms of initial carbon fixation, things like this. Another way of taking complicated information like this is to build an analogy that kind of distinguishes this. And I've come up with an analogy. I don't know how appropriate it is, but it's, it's kind of fun. So I'll share that analogy with you on Friday. And uh, if you can come up with an analogy of your own, think about the transport of things from one cell to another and things like this, come up with an analogy that, that might help you think about C4 and C3 photosynthesis in productive ways. And we'll talk about those on Friday.